I am delighted to introduce and hand over to our host this evening, writer and broadcaster Vivian Parry. Well, hello and welcome to this discussion about long COVID research and discovery. I thought I'd start with a definition of long COVID. Here goes. In a single sentence, it's a long term post acute consequence of SARS-CoV infection that affects multiple body organs and systems, causes a huge variety of symptoms and is of varying severity and duration, potentially relapsing and remitting over time. There's currently no test for long COVID. Okay, so that's where we start from. And we've got three people, sadly not four, and Susie, I know you're listening, so, uh, I hope you get better soon. Now, each of them are going to tackle long COVID from a different viewpoint. We have cardiologist and local boy, Professor Vas Vasiliu. We have GP, Dr. Sarah Glynn, and consultant cardiologist, Boon Lin. So let me go to each of you in turn, just to briefly tell me your interest in long COVID. Uh, Vaz, let's start with you. Thank you very much. So for me, um... The interest with COVID started uh, in the initial phases of the lockdown when as an academic researcher at the University of East Anglia, I couldn't do any research because the labs were closed. Therefore, all we could do was to join forces with other universities and colleagues and try and tackle research on COVID and see what might benefit patients. And then that subsequently led to research on long COVID, uh, which is what I'm currently involved with, as well as participating in the community multidisciplinary team uh, and clinics looking after patients with long COVID in Norfolk. And Sarah, you're a GP. When did you start seeing patients with long COVID? So, I mean, my interest started before the pandemic. I was uh, just a GP developing a special interest in the menopause. Um, and then COVID happened. And so from quite early on in the pandemic, it became apparent that there were some very different um, outcomes in men versus women. And it was observed pretty early on that, uh, you know, women seemed to be protected and they were less likely to end up in intensive care and they were um, had a lower risk of dying from COVID compared to men. And then by the middle towards the end of uh, 2020, I guess, uh, long COVID started to appear. And again, it just became apparent fairly quickly that many of the symptoms of long COVID are similar to what I see in perimenopausal patients. And so my interest really stemmed from there. I didn't, um, I, well, none of us really set out to become long COVID specialists because it didn't exist uh, three years ago. Um, but um, I've ended up, you know, I, I don't really know how, I've just ended up seeing lots of long COVID patients. And I think from doing things like this, people have come to see me um, and I'm, I'm helping a lot of women um, who've got evidence of hormone dysfunction in long COVID. Thank you. Uh, Boone, now because you're a specialist sort of cardiologist, aren't you? You're also an electrophysiologist. So tell us what that is. Uh, and you need to be unmuted, Boone. I am an electrician of the heart. I'm based at Imperial College London at Hammersmith Hospital and I treat people with heart rhythm disorders, the most common of which is atrial fibrillation. But my speciality interest in respect to long COVID comes from the fact that I also wear another hat, which is to run the tilt table service at Imperial, where we have traditionally over the last 10 years seen uh, patients who come in with autonomic dysfunction and specifically postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, something we now recognize. Pops. Pops, yes, exactly. Yes. Pops something we now recognize as being quite prevalent in our long COVID uh, cohort. So on the 1st of January 2021, we published one of the initial papers looking at autonomic dysfunction or describing autonomic dysfunction in long COVID from our tilt table data. And since then, the, the kind of um, ongoing treatments and understanding with respect to autonomic dysfunction and long COVID has expanded exponentially. Fantastic. Okay, now we're going to start with what are the symptoms? Now, there are 203 of them the last time I, I looked. So, um, Sarah, would you like to just have a have a stab just briefly at not listing the whole 203, but actually putting them, because I think this may be helpful for people, into the main, I think there are three main buckets, aren't there, of symptoms, which is not to say that you can't have symptoms from all three, but predominantly one or the other. 
Yes, exactly. So the most common symptoms in long COVID are fatigue, uh, difficulty concentrating or brain fog, shortness of breath and muscle aches. Those are the top four symptoms. Interestingly, other than uh, breathlessness, those are all the most common symptoms of perimenopause and menopause as well. And then there are lots of other symptoms such as uh, joint aches and pains and headaches and mood changes and temperature dysregulation, palpitations, uh, irritable bowel type symptoms, again, uh, common to both long COVID and perimenopause. And then there are other symptoms that I would say don't overlap so much with perimenopause usually. So things like POTS, as uh, Boone has already mentioned, um, uh, some patients I'm seeing have had myocarditis or pericarditis, um, and then this question over histamine intolerance or possible mast cell activation syndrome, which also has lots of overlapping symptoms. So we're talking there about a bucket, which is predominantly uh, allergies and that kind of thing. We're talking about a bucket where fatigue is the predominant symptom and another one where we're talking about heart problems, um, what's called dysautonomia. So something going wrong with the autonomic system. Okay, sorted that. Uh, Vaz, tell us now who gets it. I mean, obviously we're thinking that for people who've had intensive care and have been long time in ICU, there's something there which is not necessarily long COVID, but a long time in ICU. But there's also long COVID on, on top. So there are two different things there, aren't there? Yes. And I think it's important to actually say that um, to, to to fulfill the definition of long COVID, people need to have symptoms uh, for longer than four to 12 weeks, depending on which definition you use. If it is the National Institute of Clinical Care and Excellence definition, which is sort of 12 weeks, or some definitions from various colleges that is as little as four weeks. Um, but we need to have symptoms effectively lasting for some time. And it is true that um, we can risk profile patients at the time of their COVID infection, and we can have an indication who is more likely to get long COVID. Uh, as you mentioned quite rightly, pay patients who are hospitalized and especially the patients who are in intensive care are more likely uh, to develop long COVID. Um, but also uh, women are more likely to develop long COVID. People who are more obese are likely to develop co long COVID as well as people who are current smokers. Um, we know that people that have comorbidities like coronary disease, hypertension, asthma or other respiratory diseases or renal failure, they are more likely, again, to develop long COVID. And there is one category of people that are actually quite protected from long COVID. And those are the patients who have received at least one dose of vaccination. So if you have received at least one dose of vaccination and preferably the full dose and boosters, um, you are much less likely to develop long COVID. Um, it would be easier perhaps to say that people who remain unvaccinated are, are more than two and a half times more likely to develop symptoms lasting over 12 weeks. Okay, very good summary. Um, and by the way, um, I, I live in a block in London, which unfortunately has an awful lot of kids playing Fortnite at this very moment. So, uh, internet is flashing up horror horror children at work symbol so okay so that's that's uh, who gets it um anything uh, to add i mean sarah used as many women as men getting it yeah so you're cutting out there, Vivian, but I think you're asking me about the um, uh, the, the increased risk of long COVID that's seen in women. Um, and that's absolutely true. Um, it's probably, yes. I, I estimate uh, women between the ages of 40 and 60 probably account for about two thirds of long COVID patients. We know that the mean age of long COVID is about 46. Um, women aged 40 to 50 are twice as likely to get long COVID compared with men of the same age. And women aged 50 to 60 are at the highest risk overall they're nine times more likely to get long COVID compared with younger women in their 20s and 30s. So they're um, a big group uh, where there's lots going on in that group, but they are at, um, at particularly high risk of getting long COVID. Um, any theories as to why that might be? Yeah, so, um, I mean, any 
stress or chronic illness in itself. About, about a third of women report that their periods change after COVID. And whereas for younger women, it's often uh, more transient and their periods might recover, for women who are in their 40s and 50s, who are perhaps approaching the end of their reproductive years and have reduced ovarian reserve, it seems that their ovaries are less likely to recover. And any um, uh, woman, any sort of chronic illness can affect your periods to reduce the frequency of your periods. Um, um, but it wouldn't necessarily cause the other changes that we're seeing in the sort of perimenopausal symptoms. And what's most likely is that the ACE2 protein and the transmembrane serin, uh, serin protease enzyme, which are the two molecules that the virus attaches onto to get into the cells, uh, they are expressed all over the body, including the ovaries. We know they're on the ovaries. Uh, and post-mortem studies have demonstrated presence of virus inside ovaries. Um, and it's probable that local uh, infection and inflammation directly impacts on ovarian function uh, and the function of the ovaries is to produce hormones so ergo it will uh, cause hormone imbalance and I, I think for that there's sort of one group of women um, for whom uh, by the time I see them actually most of their symptoms if not all their symptoms are actually rooted in uh, ovarian dysfunction or perimenopause um, um, and it's they've been labeled with long with long COVID because that's where it started they felt quite well before and then the virus has push them into either an earlier or a more severe sort of perimenopause than they would have otherwise had. And then there's the other group of women for whom ovarian dysfunction is part of what's going on. Um, and so HRT um, will not cure them of their long COVID, um, but it will certainly treat the menopausal symptoms. And, you know, some of these women are severely debilitated. So even if you can only improve their quality of life by 30% or 50%, um, I think that's quite significant for some women. Um, but, um, and I think also, sorry, estrogen has lots of anti-inflammatory effects as well. So sometimes I have seen, uh, for example, I had a lady with heart rate variability and POT symptoms who those symptoms improved when she started HRT, but that I haven't seen that consistently. So I don't know why some women, you know, those types of symptoms benefit, whereas other women, they don't. I think it's a very heterogeneous group, but there's certainly a direct effect on women's ovaries in that age band. I want to tackle two particular groups that often come up. One is um, children. Um, who wants to tackle whether children get long COVID? Well, they clearly do get long COVID, but what is the effect in children? I'm guessing I'm looking at you, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so I don't see children. I'm not a, a GP anymore. I work purely in the menopause sector, so I, I, I don't see children. I know children do get long COVID, and, um, but, but I don't know much about long COVID in children. I'm sorry. I'm no expert in... in... Um, so the other particularly interesting thing is, uh, and I hope you can hear me, put your hand up if you can hear me. Good. OK, so um, one of the interesting things is that, yes, we see long COVID in people who have things like pre-existing disease like uh, diabetes, but we also see it in people who are fantastically fit. And that's a very interesting observation. Faz, would you like to comment on that? Yes, it's absolutely interesting and scary at the same time, because in medicine, we like to sort of risk stratify and put people in, in compartments, the ones at high risk, the one at less high risk. And unfortunately, uh, we see that people that for all purposes, they have been absolutely fit um, without any medical problems, they're young, they still end up getting debilitated in COVID. So we don't we don't have the answer to that. Um, and I think it all comes back to the, the question really, why do people get long COVID? And we have lots of theories why that is the case. And as everything in medicine, when you have lots of theories, it means you don't really know exactly what is causing it. Um, and one theory might be that during the acute COVID uh, infection, they develop micro clots, microemboli that cause a damage to some organs, be it the kidneys, the lungs, or the ovaries. And what we're seeing with long COVID is a long term effect of those micro clots um, distracting the usual function. The other uh, theory is that there is, there is an inflammatory response, which is out of 
sync in a way with the COVID infection. It doesn't matter how bad the COVID infection was, but your organism is so strong that mounts a huge response and doesn't switch the inflammation, the inflammatory response, the body trying effectively to find with the, the immune response uh, the initial COVID infection. The COVID infection goes away, but the immune system does not appreciate that and keeps on fighting. And that is a second theory that could explain potentially why uh, young and fit and strong individuals, including children, might have long-term um, long COVID. And, and the final mechanism um, postulated actually rests down to having residual um, virus that is still in the body so many months after the initial infection. And we do have evidence uh, that uh, people even after more than a year from their infection have um, virus still present at lower levels in their body. Um, and if I could just say something about children that we've, we've touched upon, I, I don't see children in my clinical practice, but we know that children are also likely to get long COVID. They get similar symptoms to what the adults get. Uh, reassuringly, the, the, the percentage of children having long COVID is less compared to adults, but it can also be quite debilitating. Um, I just... Would you add to that? Because there are, there are also some, some other theories. I mean, what might particularly account for the kind of dysautonomias that we were talking about, the alterations in the way that the autonomic system is working? Yeah, so I, I think um, this... Uh, can have parallels with the group of patients who, who suddenly appear to, ve to develop this autonomia, even in the absence of long COVID, even predating long COVID, we used to see a group of patients typically with ME or chronic fatigue syndrome, CFS, who got triggered by another kind of virus, which is usually the Epstein-Barr virus of glandular fever. Now, uh, I think that the mechanism is quite interesting, as, as you pointed out, in relation to the young, fit, athletic group of patients uh, are particularly worrisome because you don't know it's coming. But from my point of view, when I see these patients, typically they have had a lifetime of conditioning and training and are very fit and healthy as a consequence, have a very low normal resting blood pressure. And I think if we bring in the autonomic hypothesis, I think what COVID can do is it can do a reset, a stress reset on the central autonomic nervous system. That is the part of the brain that controls all the automatic functions we don't have to think or be concerned about because these are all subconscious. So peristalsis that affects your gut movement, heart rate control, temperature variability, um, blood pressure control, and sweatiness. All these factors have been impaired and are described as symptoms in both ME POTS, but also in a long COVID. So I think we can learn a bit about the historical way patients with POTS go on to develop POTS. They don't get born with POTS typically, something triggers it. And very interestingly, I think there is an emerging link, and this is from my clinical experience, but also in, in speaking to several rheumatologists who see lots of COVID and osteopaths, that there is an interesting link between hypermobility, the tendency to be very mobile, which apparently affects 25 to 40% of individuals. You might not know it, but there's a very simple score that you can do if you listen to this webinar. It's called a Baton score, and you can just Google it and test yourself for hypermobility. It's apparent that people who have pre-existing tendency to hypermobility, that is your gymnasts or ballet dancers, your, uh, ac your people who participated in, in, in acrobatics a as a child tend to have this low blood pressure tendency. And, and there's quite a long narrative to describe why that is, which we may come back to if you, you question me. But it could be that they are more susceptible to have the autonomic resetting low blood pressure. And every time you stand up or try and get out of bed, you then have to flood yourself with a higher adrenaline to keep that blood pressure high. And as a consequence of that, you get the palpitations and a dysfunctional breathing pattern that is mediated by high levels of adrenaline that sets in motion a whole series of cyclical cascades of multifaceted end organ issues that range from the brain to the, to the intestines, to the heart, to your temperature. So I think it's a pretty interesting unifying type diagnosis, uh, not, notwithstanding what all the other panelists have said. Well, what's interesting here is that this is not necessarily a condition for which we should seek 
one explanation to cover everything. There seems to be multiple explanation. Um, the, some people, for instance, talk about the microbiome um, as being disruption to that. Those are all the bugs that live in and on you. Um, people talk about viral debris, as you've described, Vaz. Uh, people talk about latent viruses, uh, as you have, Boone. Perhaps you've had um, glandular fever in your teens, and then you may be one of the people that gets COVID, and then it gets the the, the um, Epstein Barr gets reactivated. And there's this whole thing of autoimmunity. So there are lots of different things going on, which kind of fits with the different. I keep calling them buckets. I'm sorry if you've got a bucket. I don't mean it's very disrespectful of me. Um, but you know what I mean. In these buckets of symptoms, probably have different uh, causes. So uh, I've got some of the questions that have been sent in um, earlier. And there's an interesting one about one particular symptom, which is what's the cause for the long term loss of taste and smell? Um, experienced by a number of long COVID sufferers and what research is there on cures for that? Faz, do you want to take that? Yes, I, I, I can give my thoughts on that. So um, again, um, there is no one unifying diagnosis why people get loss of, of taste and smell. But uh, certainly when it comes to, to the smell, um, there are some believes that the acute viral infection causes an inflammation and the inflammation in the nose effectively stops the, the smell from, from reaching the areas in the nose which are responsible for then feeding to the brain to appreciate the smell. Um, in addition, there is something called the olfactory sensory neurons, which are, are effectively, um, we can think of them like parts in the nose that are responsible for collecting information. Um, and then uh, we can say broadcasting it up to the brain. And it is considered that those, those neurons um, during the acute infection, they get damaged and therefore they cannot, they cannot function well and broadcast the information they receive to the brain. The brain doesn't receive anything and cannot discriminate what, what the senses might be. Um, and, and then the final thing is that the, the pipe the pipeline, the connection between uh, the sensory neurons and the brain might also be affected. So if you think of it like um, a train line, parts of, of the train line have become um, you know, malfunction and therefore the train has to stop. Um, and, and these are the predominant theories to explain why, why people lose um, their sense of smell uh, and their sense of taste to, to a degree. And, and just to give people hope, uh, if you don't mind me saying, Epson, A-B-S-C-E-N-T, is a phenomenal charity website that uh, people can go to if you're listening to this webinar and you want to know how to improve your sense of smell. Uh, this is something on the website, they have smelling salts or uh, kind of different training smells that are pretty standard in the, in the ENT sphere to help to develop your sense of smell again. So Epson. Absolutely. And I think it's very important also to, to reassure people and not get everybody worried after this. The vast majority of the patients that have problems with sense of smell or taste go back to normal uh, within a few months, within a year. However, there is still a small proportion, a tiny proportion in the region of one to two percent that will experience problems over a year. Um, and for, for those patients that have issues in the longer term, there are multiple ongoing research studies looking at the role of omega-3, looking at the role of vitamin A being given intranasally, uh, looking at nasal steroids, or even um, rehabilitation, getting training your nose again how to work a bit better uh, by various devices that you can do online at home um, that are currently being undertaken and hopefully will be able to give us a positive result in, in the next few months. Fantastic. So we've got another question here and uh, Boone I think this one is for you. It's um, we've covered a bit of this, the typical heart related problems, but this person says, what are the red flags for more serious conditions? Because there is a danger. We've all had far less uh, care health wise over the pandemic years than perhaps we would have normally. So there is a worry, I guess, that heart conditions that people may have had are now being assumed to be long COVID when they are actually a flare-up of a condition which was coming along the track. 
Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. I think specifically from a long COVID cardiac perspective, what we need to rule out is an inflammatory heart condition, specifically myocarditis or perimyocarditis. That's inflammation of the lining of the heart, which is a pericarditis, or more sinisterly, inflammation of the actual muscle of the heart, the myocardium, hence myocarditis. And, and this uh, needs to be diagnosed. And the, the major symptom profile one would describe would be chest pain. And chest pain typically on uh, movements or with breath coming in and out, rather than chest pain on exertion per se. So I think that's the one thing that I guess you, you could miss if you're not looking for it. The other thing that realistically can happen in patients with long COVID is an arrhythmia or a heart rhythm abnormality. And the most common that we see would be something like atrial fibrillation or atrial or ventricular ectopic beats or atrial or ventricular tachycardia. So that's missing we, beats or... Uh, uh, missing beats or rapid continuous heartbeats. And in this kind of situation, I think if your palpitations, which are typically one of the major symptoms of long COVID, are very sustained and very rapid and cause you to feel extremely dizzy to the point that you're about to pass out, it could be a red flag. Now, this is, again, very confusing for some patients because when they stand up and have those orthostatic symptoms, i.e. standing, getting dizzy, and then getting palpitations, those could be misconstrued as a arrhythmia. And indeed, that is one of the most common reasons people come to my clinic to, to, to check out and rule out any dangerous heart rhythm uh, conditions. But the, the key point there to discriminate is do the arrhythmias only ever occur when you stand up and do they subside when you lie down? Because if they do, then the symptoms are more, much more in keeping with an orthostatic intolerance pattern or POTS, as we call it earlier, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Okay, that's really, really helpful. Now, there's another question, which again, I think this one is for Vaz, because one of the things, before we go on to talk about uh, treatments and uh, research in treatments, is that, and this is something that's bedeviled the whole um, field of ME, I know, is being clear about what actually is long COVID. Because there's not a test, it's really then quite difficult to make sure that all the people that you've got in a particular research trial have actually got long COVID and, some, or, and not something else. Yes, uh, it, it, it's a very good question. And it is true that um, at some stage, everybody in the United Kingdom will get COVID. And therefore, it would be tempting to, to attribute any symptoms thereafter that they might get that they, they, they're labeled as long COVID. And if we look at the current definitions, um, all you need to have to, to, to be labeled as long COVID is to have had COVID infection, and then to develop one of the 203 symptoms that you have described, or we have talked about, that they last for more than 12 weeks. It's also very important to say that a lot of the patients would have got the very similar symptoms irrespective of COVID. And as Boone is saying, they used to have POTS patients before COVID. Uh, he continues to see POTS patients after COVID. And some of those patients, their POTS relates to COVID. Therefore, unfortunately, at the moment, it's very difficult. And it does mean that any beneficial effect of medication or rehabilitation specifically to COVID is likely to be diluted by patients that have the same symptoms who have had COVID, but actually their symptoms do not relate to the COVID infection and long COVID itself. It's a really, really complex field, isn't it? So let's move on to treatments. So let's start, Sarah, with uh, you. And what, what's the kind of the first line of, of, of treatment? So you establish that somebody has long COVID, what next? So I think in the first instance, um, you know, all the trials at the moment are ongoing. There isn't a cure for long COVID at the moment, but there are sensible things that people can do. It's a real shame that Susie's not here because um, so the first step I would say is to avoid triggers to long COVID and things that make your symptoms worse. So common, uh, common triggers would be things like stress, uh, sleep, uh, low mood, uh, feeling anxious, depressed, overdoing it, whether that's cognitively or physically, uh, poor gut health, these are all things that 
any patient with long COVID can address. Um, it can take a lot of hard work. Uh, Susie's got some uh, uh, some great programs. Her website, 360 Mind, Body, Soul, has got lots of information for long COVID sufferers, and she's designed some specialist programs that concentrate on breath work and mindfulness and meditation. And in fact, uh, Boone and Susie did a great interview that I watched on YouTube a while ago, um, talking about, and Boone can talk about this in a minute, uh, that the top down versus the bottom up approach, which is actually, when I watched that interview, was the first time I really sort of understood how to think about it and how to talk about it to patients. So those things uh, are all really important. Um, other generalized treatments, obviously in the patients that I see, um, HRT, uh, hormone um, imbalance is very easy to address and uh, not always uh, actually, but usually it's easy to address. Um, and if you've got symptoms of hormone deficiency, they will definitely get better if you address them with hormone replacement. I think antihistamines are very useful. And then beyond that, it would be symptom specific treatments. So, you know, depending on the problem. So obviously, um, you know, the cardiologists are using medications for POTS and for palpitations, etc. cetera, um, anti-inflammatories, myocarditis, uh, pericarditis, et cetera. But broadly speaking, that's how I think about treatment. I don't know if the others would agree or if they're doing things differently. Okay, uh, Boone, let's talk about that and also some of these other things like, um, you know, anticoagulants. Yeah, so um, if, I, if I may, uh, or if you could indulge me, I'd like to just briefly mention the parable of the blind men and the elephants. The six blind men of Hindustan are all asked to describe an elephant, and the first one who touches the side describes it as a wall, and the one who touches its trunk describes it as a, uh, as a tree branch and the one who touches its um, tusk says it's a spear and so on and so forth. All of them are right, really, but all of them are also not right. So they're correct and incorrect because no one of them uh, has an eye to see what the elephant as it truly exists. And I think we are all caught in a similar picture with the blind ologists around the world. So if you go and see a gastroenterologist with your IBS symptoms, there's a whole path you go down. If you see a rheumatologist, if you see a, a psychologist, if you see a cardiologist, I'm guilty as much as everyone else. We focus on the heart. We sell the mask about sleep. If we see a woman's health specialist, uh, they focus on what they focus on. They may not ask about psychology or the heart. I mean, not Sarah, of course, she asks for everything, but... I think we are speaking to a group of people here who have spent considerable time looking and trying to unblind ourselves when actually most of the medical community are necessarily blind. We live in an era of sub-specialist training. I don't even know how to blow up a stent in a coronary artery, and yet I have to learn about gastro stuff. It doesn't figure, right? I'm a cardiologist. So in order to really get it right, we need to see long COVID for the true full magnificent elephant in all its splendor and taking a unifested, unidirectional, unidiagnostic approach does not help. I would like to kind of suggest that there is a factory up top with, which is spewing out lots of stuff, right? And some of that could be microclots, some of that could be viral debris, immune reaction, reactivity that is setting in motion downstream a lot of other effects, including functional gut, temperature dysregulation, palpitations, or bearing dysfunction. And actually, if you catch it up top, and, and alluding to the point that Sarah made, I fully believe in Susie Bolt's uh, way, and it's such a shame she's not here, but she has a really uh, top-down approach. I like both the bottom-up and the top-down, and the way I think about it is that if you want to calm this inflammatory factory in your, in your brain, which is the subconscious autonomic brain, and you start with the breath, you immediately turn off sympathetic and switch on vagus, i.e. you become more coherent and slow down the breathing, more vaguely expressive. You allow so just, the just explain. So the vagus is this wandering nerve that kind of goes- yeah. across. The vagus is the opposite um, nerve to the sympathetic nervous system. So it mediates the rest, rejuvenation, relaxation, digestion, as opposed to the fright or flight that is mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. They are both necessary for life. Think of a yin and yang symbol. The heat, the sun, the masculine, the, the activity of the yang comes from the sympathetic nervous system. The feminine, the moon, the relaxing rejuvenation comes from the vagus. You need an, a, a method to, to make your yin yang ball more towards the central point. I wouldn't even say more vagus, 
you just need to de-express the sympathetic nervous system and find a balance. And the best way for me would be to breathe into your autonomic nervous system because that immediately lowers your heart rate and exerts a vagal control. And then the second thing, which is what Susie does very well, is a top-down approach. So bottom-up means your physiological processes are affecting the autonomic nervous system and recalibrating it. The top-down approach is when you use a feeling or an NLP type program to train the brain into behaving in a more coherent, uh, more uh, centered manner where you have more balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Thank you. Um, uh, Vaz, what about things like uh, Paxlovid or um, Ivermectin even? What about some of the drugs that are appearing? Yes, I, th I think it's very important I think it's, uh, it's important to understand the patient journey and some of the patients are very desperate to get their lives back and willing to try anything really that might help. Um, and that is where we end up um, pushing for treatments that do not have any real evidence. So when it comes to long COVID, uh, I'm not aware of any medication that actually cures long COVID. Uh, we have medication that they might make the symptoms better until time resolves the long COVID. But I would certainly not advocate radical treatments that have no evidence. Uh, and in fact, we know that sometimes there is a lot of enthusiasm, um, but then we appreciate as people use new medication outside license, we appreciate the side effects um, a bit more. Therefore, I think when it comes to um, treatment, I would definitely recommend what the NHS uh, supports, which would be based on evidence and allow time for the research studies to, to report the findings. So, so when I last checked this morning, there were 193 intervention trials on clinicaltrials.gov. That is a trial that has been registered with a central trial organization looking into exploring interventions. And guess how many are uh, to do with mind-body interventions or more holistic integrations of movement, physiological processes, neurocognitive retraining, and yoga and mind-body interventions, I think more than 40%, uh, maybe even 50%, but you know, the rest of them tend to be sponsored by pharma with very few exceptions, and they tend to be unilaterally focused. So in, in coming back to the parable of the blind man and the elephant, the person who's treating the uh, rope or the tail of the elephant might be wanting to buy some hairbands to tie the rope together, which is fraying. And that is saying that maybe this wonderful drug, which is called X, Y, or Z, uh, can help with that particular mechanism uh, to help treat long COVID. But one of the things which is very challenging about any of these trials is what is the big picture? How do you see long COVID as a whole? And that is a challenge that is very, very difficult to, to, to address. Because it's tempting to say, isn't it, that actually what we need in this area is what's called a platform trial. So if you don't know what that is, uh, um, the recovery trial that everybody heard about was a platform trial. In other words, it was randomised. People went in um, and they were randomised to a particular treatment. And we found out really quickly that dexamethasone worked, but that hydrochloroquinone didn't work. But it's very difficult to do that kind of trial, which gets results very quickly with long COVID, because as you say, it's not a single entity and you, you're not treating a single symptom. So it's a very difficult thing to, to, to do. Um, Sarah. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to, to add to that as well. I think, you know, what Boone is saying about the elephant uh, idea is very true. But I think the other problem with long COVID is a lot of different groups of patients have been all grouped together under the long COVID umbrella. So I don't even think we're just looking at an elephant. I think we're probably looking at an elephant and then, you know, my patients might, I don't know, be a cat or something. And, you know, what's going to work for an elephant's tail is not going to work for, you know, a cat's ears or whatever. You know, you could say what you like. But, um, you know, I think, I think some work needs to be done as well to sort of better define it's true that for example being on intensive care and being acutely unwell increases your risk of long covid but the vast majority of patients with long covid had a mild illness and were managed in the community and it's you know it's inevitable if you've been on intensive care and you've had multi-organ failure or you know been severe
severely unwell, of course you're not going to feel better 12 weeks later. But that's very different from the sort of person that I'm seeing, a sort of middle-aged woman with hormone problems. It's probably very different to the types of patients that Vass and Boone are seeing. Children, I think, are very different. You know, so uh, older people with lots of comorbidities, I think these are very different groups of people. Um, so it's not even just the elephant in the room, is it? It's, it's what else is in the room as well and what we're confusing and, and trying to, you know, we need to tease it apart much better. So, yeah, so, so one thing I would add, and, and maybe I'll speak on behalf of Susie, is to say that Susie is not an ologist. She doesn't come from that background and she doesn't have any diagnostic tests at her at her disposal. She has friends uh, who can give her advice, but actually one of the things that I've been super impressed with with Susie's group work is that I only found out about Susie, by the way, because so many patients came to see me and told me that in conjunction with what I've been giving them to help with their orthostatic intolerance, for example, Susie is, Susie's program was the thing that switched them uh, into a different mindset, even thinking of illness or gap expectation reset. So that means that if you expect that you're gonna go back to work in three months time, and you always have a stress that you're going to get back to work and oh no, I'm not making it, I'm not making it. This in itself is an autonomic trigger. And Susie does so well to diffuse some of the multifaceted stresses that come in that as doctors or ologists, we don't even think about. So there is a piece of the puzzle missing and it's necessarily missing from a clinical trial brain because as scientists, we are left brain and we always focus on the endpoint. There's something in a clinical trial, Vivian, which is called study endpoint, primary and secondary. What does that mean? It's my primary not endpoint is, that, is that I reduce the heart rate by 20 beats per minute and I give somebody propranol. Wow, I've succeeded, right? But what does that mean if a patient still can't go back to work, can't stand out of bed and can't construct a sentence or read the emails because their brain fog is up, up, up the spell. So really we need to be careful when you read a clinical trial, the holistic piece is still missing. And when you go into a group, and Susie's is not the only group, there are, there are several other groups, but the holistic piece is the focus of group's attention. So I think we need to marry our mechanisms and science and be open as scientists to other ways of healing. And COVID is a great experience for us, very humbling for me as an academic and a cardiologist and electrophysiologist to know, oh my God, never heard of this, what's helping? And in opening my eyes and becoming less blind, I think I've become a better holistic practitioner, wouldn't even say cardiologist. And I think one of the important things that we need to think about here is if we do develop trials, then they need to be co-produced with people who are living with long COVID, because otherwise I, I think you don't get to an end point, which is what people want, because frequently ologists, as you say, are trying to get to an end point, which is a number which is reduced. But as you say, the end point might actually be that people return to work. That might be the end point that's appropriate for, for, for them. But Vaz, that makes running clinical trials very difficult, doesn't it? Yes, and, and I think it all comes back to what you referred to initially as patients have are in different buckets. Therefore, it might be, I, I, I think in the long term, we might be able to discern who goes in which bucket and what treatment works for each bucket. And certainly whether it is medical treatment or whether it's um, uh, treatment based on behavior and, and supporting the individuals and effectively what Boone uh, was describing with the work with Susie, um, it will probably end up being a combination of everything. And I think I would like to say something here because we are in, in Norfolk and in the Norfolk uh, long COVID um, uh, treatment group that is running the community, we, we actually, we absolutely have a look at the patients as individuals. And we have a meeting between us discussing uh, most of the patients that are needed where all of us sit together. Therefore, we try to get the left hand to speak to the right hand and to understand what's happening in, in, the, in the bowel, what's happening in the lungs, what's happening in the heart, and everyone gives their opinion. And we try to see the patient as an individual and understanding their needs and what is exactly important for them. Because yes, for someone, it might be dropping the heart rate by 20 beats, 
but for most pe pe people, it's the ability to have a normal quality of life that is acceptable to them. Um, and, and that is what we should all focus and try to do. Um, one final thing before we leave treatments. So you've all mentioned in your different ways that people are naturally desperate with long COVID. You know, they want their lives back. And that leads them to try treatments which are going to be completely useless and are offered to them cynically and often for very large amounts of money by people. And are there any treatments that you think people should definitely avoid, but which are touted for long COVID? I mean, certainly one of the treatments that has been offered abroad is uh, plasma apheresis, which basically means they take your blood out, they clean it and put it back in. That's quite a risky procedure and a very expensive one that has uh, no evidence that it works. Um, we know something called the placebo effect, where patients believing that they receive treatment, mentally they get they find the strength and the stamina and they start feeling better. Um, and they might get better after having an invasive procedure. We know that is also true. However, ultimately, um, there is no evidence that any such treatment at the moment at whatever cost you might incur is beneficial. And in fact, you might have the, the risk associated with that. Therefore, what I would recommend is if you are in, in that unfortunate situation where you're desperate uh, paying to have a treatment that is not recommended uh, by the NHS, it would be worth having a discussion with your GP, getting referred to the regional um, long COVID clinic to be able to discuss that further. Can I, can I take yeah. a, an, an opposing view and, and just say what are the treatments that we know can work already uh, for, for virtually nothing? I would say vitamin D is quite a crucial vitamin that is lacking in everyone in the UK. So it's worth, worth topping up on vitamin D. The other drugs that are available are available. The greatest pharmacy we have is in our brain and in our bodies. And if we can unlock that pharmacy through sleep and rest and recovery, through better thinking, better breathing, better feeling, I think that unlocks a freebie treatment that can go so far uh, and so far ahead in, in, in helping. So th those are the two things that, that I just yeah. want to add. Uh I agree. I agree with those. I agree completely. Having a healthy lifestyle, which includes proper amount of sleep, is important. And I also agree that a lot of people in the UK are vitamin D deficient, mainly because we don't have any sun. Um, therefore, um, if you know you are vitamin D deficient and it gives you tiredness, it would be important to sort of take some vitamin D and, and come back to normal level. OK, Sarah, briefly from you, then there's a big question I want to ask all of you. Yes, yeah, so I, I just wanted to add in, obviously, um, you know, two thirds of patients are women between the ages of 40 to 60 and hormone imbalance is a really big problem in that group. Um, and, you know, that the types of HRT that we prescribe nowadays are very safe. They're available on the NHS. They don't increase the risk of breast cancer. They don't increase the risk of blood clots. They don't increase. In fact, they reduce the risk of things like heart disease in the long term and dementia and osteoporosis. They've got all these long term health benefits. And there is no that there's no way of knowing if hormone imbalance is part of your clinical syndrome and uh, because there's no diagnostic test for either long COVID or the perimenopause and the only way to find out is to try HRT and I really can't think of many reasons at all why women can't have HRT and you've got nothing Except to lose. if you can't get it let's not go there yes. <laughs> yes. okay so but there are lots of alternatives there's, there's okay Thank okay, you. so the big question I want to ask you all, which is asked several times by uh, people, uh, what is the long term prognosis and will I ever recover? Is it just will you ever recover fully from long COVID or is it a case of reducing stress and the sympathetic nervous system response to avoid relapses? OK, um, Boone, I'm going to start with you. It's 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 a yes or no. Will you ever recover? Yes. If it's a yes or no, it's yes. Sarah? I agree. If it's one or the other, it's yes. I think, again, we're grouping lots of different types of patients together under one umbrella, but I've certainly seen some patients recover, and I've certainly seen some patients are recovering, um, and I, I agree with Boone. I think, yeah, I'd say yes. Us. So uh, the vast majority, yes. So 
we know, however, that What's people the that have majority in percentage terms more, more, have... more than more than ninety nine percent. There is a small proportion that have have had strokes. They had scar on the heart. Uh, those people might get better, but the stroke will not go away. So if we exclude the people that have organic problems, in other words, that things are fine, um, they will get better. So I would like to be optimistic, but I would not wish everybody to think that everyone, absolutely everyone will be much better in say 12 months. The vast majority, more than 99% will. Okay, and the final question is one which is a bit different from the ones that we've had so far. Is the government taking the long COVID situation seriously in terms of uh, individual workforce and economic impact? Bas, what about you? Um, I think the government has done some very good things. For example, very quickly, they provided extra money to be able to form long COVID clinics, which is the primary source of, of support. Uh, for individuals in the majority of the UK. Could they have done more? Absolutely. Um, there could have been a lot more money provided to uh, find people to work in the long COVID services. There could have been more things done for the patients to be able to uh, effectively be off work and focus on on getting better and getting healthier and, and utilizing anything that might make them better um, as opposed to being signed off sick leave and, and uh, relying on money from the government. Um, so I think the government has done some things. Um, they could have done more in my view. Okay, Sarah. I think no, <laughs> I don't think they have done enough. Um, I think the long COVID clinics are fine, but I think they're very hit and miss. I think there are some really good long COVID clinics. I think there are some really quite poor long COVID clinics where patients um, are not being seen. They're not being seen in a timely fashion. They're not being treated. They're not being offered HRT. Uh, and the most severely ill patients, the ones that can't get to the clinics are the ones that are having the worst service because they're getting a telephone appointment and basically being offered pacing and some antihistamines if they're lucky. Um, I don't think women are being helped I think you know being a middle-aged menopausal woman is quite difficult anyway you're being sandwiched you know, between parents that might need care children that might need care your house your home your job it could be hard enough in the workplace there's been lots of stuff in social media and the news about you know problems that women have uh, with equality etc and I think long COVID is making it a lot lot harder and I don't think women are being helped I'm seeing lots of patients that uh, their lives have just imploded since they caught this virus and it is absolutely shocking um, how little help and they're losing their jobs and they're you know the, the employment Employers don't understand how to manage them, um, and I'm going on a rant, so I'll stop now. But uh, <laughs> no, Sarah, you <laughs> yeah, you're, you're allowed. To, you're allowed to do ranting. Ranting is fully allowed in <laughs> science festival. So um, Boone, I mean, one area that is clearly, I, I think, perhaps not as, as recognised is that the, the, the person who asked this question implied it is the impact on workforce. There are an awful lot of people who have long COVID and who either haven't gone back to work or have just given up work altogether because perhaps they were close to retirement age or they were doing a, a, a really demanding job and they thought, you know, I've got this, I don't want to go back to that kind of job. So it has has an impact, hasn't it? I, I think in a remarkable twist, COVID has also provided the best return to work possible because COVID caused a shutdown in transport and, um, and office-based work. It led to a transition to what we're doing now. We're doing a Zoom consultation or we're doing a Zoom webinar rather than meeting face-to-face. -face. And if you have an illness, which is chronic, that means you can't be out and about commuting, the best way to transition back into your job is to have the uh, acceptance of this to Zoom or Teams-based style meeting. So, so I think, that there, this, this kind of ability to transition back has come in, but mainly not driven by the government. I mean, people and businesses, large businesses across, including the NHS, for, for the longest time, it felt like the longest time, but probably a year, we were doing Zoom and telephone clinics because we shut down our outpatient services and, and it kind of worked out. It became the new normal. And it's how people with long COVID are going to be able to, I think, transition back into the workforce. Notwithstanding all the negatives that come from a lack of, in fact, face-to-face -face or social interaction by the water cooler, this has been a helpful way to get back into the workforce. 
So our final question, because we've now only got uh, three minutes left and gosh, hasn't this flown past, it's been so interesting, is, um, and it's really to, to, to Vass and Boone, are you hopeful that there will be some really interesting research? Because you said, um, Vass, there's a, there's a lot of uh, clinical, oh, sorry, Boone, there's a lot of clinical trials, but there are also a lot of other um, pieces of work, not only in the UK, of course, but right across the NIH in the US have an enormous long COVID uh, program. So, so the, the most wonderful thing about long COVID, in my opinion, is that it's brought together a community of patients who actually came together to coin the term long COVID originally. And for once, it was the patients driving change, the agenda for change, because these patients will not be kept silent. And a lot of the patients who have the biggest voices are actually consultant physicians, professor and professors who are academic, who are medical, and who have no access to any of the interventions or the resources that they read about. And so they are becoming the voice of change. So we have this groundswell and a different way of doing business in the medical world, which I really like to see, because it gives us the opportunity to lead from a patient journey forwards. It comes back to your point about saying that any trial needs to encompass a patient voice or a patient adv advocacy to, to collaborate with the large clinical trial group. And more and more of that is happening. I wow. agree. I agree entirely. And, and we do see the patient and public involvement, patient advocacy uh, being championed uh, in, in research and especially COVID and long COVID research. Uh, and the funding bodies in the UK, when we talk about the National Institute of Health Research, um, other funding bodies like Wellcome, the MRC, uh, the British Heart Foundation, they do take long COVID very seriously and have special calls for research where you can only apply if you're proposal is, is for long COVID, for example. Therefore, I'm very optimistic about the amount and the quality of research that we will be able to do and we're currently doing both in the UK and abroad. Um, but ultimately, what it would be really fantastic if those the research provides a positive result like the recovery did, which will transform the lives of our patients. Um, and, and that is what we are all eager and hopeful that we will be able to see at the end of it. Thank you. So if I can sum up that, you know, here is a condition which is mysterious in many, many ways. I think there has to be a collaborative approach, you know, from the from uh, the bottom and the top, as you would say, Boone, in order to try and overcome it. And I think that actually it will be very interesting research because I think it may um, highlights the causes of another mystery condition, um, ME, and many of the other post-viral syndromes that there, that there are. So I think there is so much to look forward to in terms of what is going to be done. And I'm taking away from all of you, and I say it to all of you listening, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Most people recover. I wish you well in your recovery journey and thank you to our three participants and to Susie who can't be with us. Um, thank you to you. So Vas Vasilu, Boon Lim and Sarah Glynn. Goodbye for now. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vivian, for uh, ensuring we covered uh, the subject as much as we could tonight and addressing so many of the audience's questions. That was fantastic. Um, and thank you to our panel, Vas, Sarah and Boone for showing their knowledge and expertise as well. I, I know I've learned so much the, this evening, so thank you. Uh, just a reminder to our audience as well that we've recorded this session and we'll be posting it to uh, the Norwich Science Festival website um, at the end of the festival. So thank you once again and good night. <laughs>